mentorship leadership accountability these are the values we hold dear to our hearts until now the birth and growth of toastmasters in the bahamas has been one of the nation's most compelling untold stories it's a story of growth a story of triumph through adversity a story of perseverance in defining moments a story of hope and of purpose it was not by accident that toastmasters came to the bahamas in 1968 a time when our nation needed it most although the country had vibrant political leaders they could not do it alone it was critical that Bahamians from all sectors of society be equipped with the tools to become leaders and competent communicators in order to affect change within themselves and ultimately the nation. This is the story of the first Bahamas branch of Toastmasters Club 1600 as told through the voices of the past and the present. These are the echoes of history. In 1905, a man by the name of Ralph Smedley formed what would come to be known as the first ever Toastmasters Club. At the time, he had just begun working for the YMCA in Chicago, Illinois. Smedley was passionate about helping the men of the community learn to speak and express themselves. Unfortunately, due to the weight of his responsibilities at the YMCA, he was not able to maintain the program. He would try again in 1924, now as the director of the YMCA in Santa Ana, California. This time, he would be successful, involving friends and colleagues as he formed the club that would eventually become Club Number no. 1 in Toastmasters International. By the 1930s, the organization had grown throughout British Columbia and Canada. The organization would continue to grow in the 40s and 50s and in 1962, move to Toastmasters International headquarters in Santa Ana. Meanwhile in the Bahamas, the 1960s ushered in an era of transformation. A social and economic system which excluded the majority of the people had been eradicated forever. In 1967, the Progressive Liberal Party clenched election victory, ushering in majority rule, adult suffrage, and the democratization of the Bahamas. There was a real need for learned individuals who could help guide the Bahamas down a path to growth and prosperity. The birth of the first Bahamas branch of Toastmasters Club 1600 came during this critical juncture. The vision of Club, well, Toastmasters in the Bahamas uh, came from Peter Drudge. And Peter Drudge was an employee of the Bahamas government who lived in Canada. And he heard about Toastmasters and what benefits uh, such an organization would do for the Bahamas. And he liked, and he parted the information on to Ernest Ron, who liked, also liked the idea. The concept of Toastmasters was to develop or teach young men the art of communication and leadership. And as a result, Ernest liked the idea so much that he went around the Bahamas along with Peter Drudge and myself and recruited quite a number of men. As a matter of fact, I believe our first meeting, we had something like 24, 24 men who answered the call and they formed the first club on December 5th, 1968 in the halls of St. Benedict Priory Grounds. The official charter of Club 1600 was presented at an installation banquet on March 8th, 1969 by the late Celindon Pinling who was also a guest speaker. He was made an honorary member on that evening, and Ernest T. Strawn was the charter president. Ernest sold it good. He, he, he knew what he was doing. He was a politician. And he told you all the things that you need to know and where you need to be and everything else. And 
we bought it. And it was, he was right. In those days, I lived in Oaksville, and he asked if they could use my house because it was centrally located. So we used that. Uh, we, my wife knew a meeting was coming there every week. She, she was used to it. I believe she liked it because uh, other than that, we had no money to, to spend. But So that was a, a night out for her, even though it was inside. Toastmasters got off to an admirable start. Word and excitement about the program spread quickly through the capital. Within the first year of its existence, Club 1600 had already started branching out into the wider community through the establishment of gavel clubs in high schools, which would prepare students for public speaking opportunities. What, what we recognized is that if we were able to, to expose the Toastmasters program to younger persons, it will help feed members to our to 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 the club level, either to become part of our club, but also to form new clubs. So that was the twin initiative that we had. That we thought they embraced the young. We also thought <coughs> that it would have been a wonderful um, initiative to have children understand. The, the need to be able to communicate, the need to be able to, have, to speak publicly, to think on their feet, and, uh, and to learn what I call parliamentary um, rules. So as to, and, how, and what I call the engagement of debate, not only debate, but in, and conversations. And we embarked upon the program of forming gavel clubs. I think we even had one in the prison, and um, and we tried to get one in each of the high schools. Um, Charles Charlie De, Charles Devo, past master, past president Charles Devo, was one of our key. He, along with um, Roll, forgot his first name now, were very key and instrumental in forming gavel clubs and working with these young people in the clubs. Their programs were the, what I call the senior program, those master's program. And uh, we, we, that was quite an effective way of making, making contact, having young people engaging in debate, public speaking, and learning what I call the qualities of leadership. Back then, I worked for Her Majesty's prison. And I, I ran a school, so to speak, right? Because there were a lot of grown inmates who couldn't read and write. And so we, I found myself teaching them at say a BJC level to try and get them up to speed with basic educational stuff. And one day I saw in the newspapers that this Toastmasters Club was meeting. And they gave a brief rundown history, I should say, of what Toastmasters is, how it came to be. I found it quite interesting. And I said, you know, this is the kind of stuff I need to expose these inmates to that may help in their development, help them when they get back out into society. And so I called a number that was placed in the newspapers and I asked whether they could do one or two demonstration meetings at the prisons. Well, they finally agreed and we did that. And then when I saw the demonstration, they went through table topics and speeches and evaluations and so on. I found it all quite interested. It's interesting that I decided I'll go out to their meetings myself and become a little more familiar. And I ran out and that's it, I'm still here. <laughs> In 1969, the club would host the first ever high school speech competition in the country. These speech competitions would allow high school students to gain exposure, practice speaking publicly, and become involved in the national discourse of the day. 
One of the high school students participating in the competition that year was a young, politically inspired Fred Mitchell, who participated again in 1970. I was um, uh, in the fourth year of uh, school at St. Augustine's College, and it seemed to me like at the end of the year. And I got a note from my English teacher saying that I was being asked to represent the school at a speech contest, which was being fostered by uh, Toastmasters Club, which is a new club. And amongst the people I remembered meeting for the first time would be Ernest Strong, uh, Peter Drudge, uh, Alfred Maycock, and Andrew Conliffe, all of whom I developed relationships with uh, in the long term. Anyway, so I, it was the day before the contest, and I was told to go and represent the school. I forget what the topic was. Of course, the topic of the day in that year was, can the Bahamas be an independent country? Which of course is an academic question now. So I go to the speech contest and instead of sticking to the topic, I wrote in longhand how this was so disorganized, they call me at the last minute, they need to know better and all the rest. They were very gracious, you know, um, Ernest Strawn was the president and he was the master diplomat. He thanked me very much, said they would do better next time and then promptly gave me last place. <laughs> so that taught me. And when I talk to some of the younger politicians today, I say, and they ask you, is there a price for freedom? And there is a price for freedom. You know, you say something, there's always a consequence. But it's a lesson. Um, and um, the next year, uh, I was invited back again. And I got second place that time. And I was, when we were doing the, um, the pre the screening of this event uh, that we're engaged now is saying that that was the first time I met Cecil, not the first time as a, as a, as a grown-up, I met Cecil Wallace Whitfield, I'd known him as a child. He was then the Minister of Education, and uh, I said to him on the stage, I think it was the old government high school, I said to him on the stage, you know that I want to join your party. And he said, okay, very good, you should do that. Of course, by the time I did join, which was in 74, he was gone and uh, in another party but again, shows you the historic point at which all of this occurred. And I only now appreciate, looking back at it, I can't believe it's 52 years, I only now appreciate what was actually happening in the Bahamas, that these were the captains of the new country, and uh, that they were engaged in establishing a new country, and many of them had just come back home from school. And uh, so they were actually contributing to building the country. And I would say this also, the end of the story is with Toastmasters, is that I became foreign minister in 2002. And I remember setting out, uh, reading the country's statement on the national, international stage of the United Nations in September of, night, of 2002. And as I walked out on the stage behind the green podium, I looked out at all these people there. I said, ah, this is what the Toastmasters speech contest was for. I, I literally thought of it. I said, I, I now understand. The wave of political and social activism that swept across America and the Caribbean in the 60s continued on in the early 1970s. The need for leaders skilled in communication continued to grow, and as the need grew, so did the presence of Toastmasters in the country. Leading the expansion was none other than the members of Club 1600. In, the, the, in that era, uh, right, the new government uh, came in and they thought many of the persons really, they were not a sharp parliamentary procedure which is based around those two masses. They didn't know much about that. And, and Ernest Ron, Peter Drudge came and they said, hey, we have to start educating these persons and, uh, and they therefore uh, this would be a good forum for them to become a part, to learn if they want to start getting into politics. Because, you know, our race like me were not a part at that time of the government until, until uh, in the 60s, yeah, in, the, in that particular era. When I heard some of my friends speaking very highly about this esteemed program, Toastmasters, Michael Cooper, and Zeph, Zeph Bullard. And they spoke so highly about this. I was literally afraid because the things they said and, and, and how evaluation was the process of evaluation 
made me somewhat timid. And Mike Cooper and Zeff, they spoke about this as being, it's so privileged for one to, to be a part of this. And as the years move on, I said, one day I'm going to join this organization. And my good friend, Postmaster Mike Cooper, one evening I went to meeting with him. I spoke also with, with Richard Marshall, who was a member of Postmasters. And behold, when I got there and saw the way it was, saw the reality of it, I was very much impressed. It was like a magnet. And from that night on, I became a member of that meeting, of that group. After they had um, interviewed me, made me official, then I was truly a committed Toastmaster. In 1971, distinguished Toastmaster Ernest T. Strawn and Peter Drudge started the first Bahamas branch of Toastmistresses. This club would mirror Club 1600, but would be exclusively for women, as at the time, women were not permitted to join Toastmasters. Women, women wanted to become Toastmasters, but because of the rules at that time, uh, Toastmasters is only for male men. As a matter of fact, we had a slogan for men on the move. But what Ernest and Peter Drudge did, they went out and solicited Toastmistress Club. They used the same format as Toastmasters, and they were able to form a club for them so that they can become use the benefits of those masters. In 1972, the first Freeport branch, 1425, was chartered. The charter president was Richard Demerit, former financial secretary in the Ministry of Finance. In 1973, Toastmasters International opened its membership to women. New Providence branch of Toastmasters Club 3596 was chartered. Toastmasters Whitney Roll was the charter president. A few months later, Toastmasters Club Action for Achievement Club 1095 was formed under the leadership of Toastmaster Marina Dane, the first female club president in the Bahamas. In each case, members of Club 1600 took a leadership role in the formation of these clubs. That same year, at Toastmasters International Conference in Texas, Toastmaster Patrick Bosfield made a compelling case for the Bahamas to become an area. The majority club agreed that we should become um, a part of the district to enable members to get more exposure, more recognition for the work that they would have done in and outside of the club. And so, yes, 73 was a momentous occasion. We, we made we were able to make contact with uh, persons in the district, which is 10 District 47. And uh, my recollection is that the area we were, we, the, the nearest area, because at that time, the Toastmasters and districts, which were, which were made up of several areas, and so District 47, one of the areas they had was Area 19, which is the closest, which is the most proximate um, uh, area for us to join. 47 also being the most proximate district for us to join. At the time, all of the existing clubs in the Bahamas, including Club 1600, were unrestricted or reported directly to Toastmasters International in California. The status request was granted, and Vicki Wood of Florida became the first area governor for the Bahamas. She was followed by Club 1600's Toastmaster Patrick Bosfield in 1974, Distinguished Toastmaster Lester Gibson in 75, and Distinguished Toastmasters James Ramming and Francis Gibson in 1976 and 77, respectively. We formed, we formed three clubs. I think it was um, 78, 79, somewhere around there, because that had to get us uh, affiliated to District 47. That was the only way we could get in, because we started off as 1600U, undestricted. And um, around 78, 79, we hooked up with uh, the area governor from Fort Lauderdale, District 47. And that's when it started. 
And like I said, we kept going to various seminars and conventions that the district held until we developed ourselves to four clubs and we got the area status. And then from there we went into seven clubs and we got the district st uh, status and we just kept going. Um, I eventually ended up as, I think, third, the third district governor for the area. In 1976, members of Club 1600, including distinguished Toastmasters Patrick Bosfield, James Ramming, Lester Gibson, and Malachi Lundy, started Executive for Excellence, Toastmasters Club 2985, the first corporate club. The charter president was James Ramming, and the purpose of the club was to re-engage in active members. The club disbanded after two years. In 1979, Corporate Bahamas started to embrace the Toastmasters program. Multiple clubs were chartered, including Bahamas Electricity Corporation, Bahamas Blenders, and Kalina, to name a few. Also in 1979, Toastmasters officially branched off into Andrus. Former president of Club 1600, Samuel Bain, was transferred to Andrus via the Ministry of Education, and while there, he requested Club 1600 to charter Toastmasters Club on the island. As the 1980s rolled in, Toastmasters continued to thrive in the Bahamas. By 1981, we see the Bahamas elevated to a division, having chartered the necessary 12 clubs to acquire the status largely thanks to the assistance of members of Club 1600. Bahamians were successfully matriculating through the Toastmasters program and several received the Able Toastmasters status, a distinction reserved for Toastmasters who had successfully completed the education program requirements of the Toastmasters International. I attended several meetings prior to actually joining because it's a part of the program that one visits at least three consecutive meetings prior to, to submitting an application to become a part. So that's what I would have done. And I was pretty impressed with the meetings. And I realized that one of the things that distinguished Toastmasters from other programs was that it's an environment where people learn in an atmosphere of fun by doing. And I realized that there's no other way to learn than by doing. You can listen to, to people and perhaps you pick up maybe 5% or less of what they're saying. But personally, what I have found, I also work in the um, in the IT industry and, and in science. And even as a mathematician myself, we have to do things. We don't just sit and listen to a lecturer or professor lectures, but we then have to apply what we would have learned. And I realized that sitting and listening, you learn virtually nothing. You learn when you do. And because of that attribute in the Toastmasters program, I thought it was it was an excellent thing to be a part of. As I said, there's no other program like it because you learn by doing, and there's no other way to learn than by doing. After thriving for years at the local level, Bahamian Toastmasters also started to set their sights on international competitions hosted by Toastmasters International. These competitions would take place starting at the area level, then the district, then the division, and finally at the international level. During this era, a new crop of communicators would elevate the Bahamas on the world stage to heights not seen before. Two Bahamians in particular would grace the stage at the international speech competition, then considered to be the Olympics of public speaking. They were Clothie Lockhart and former president of Club 1600, Kerry Poitier. That is listening, thinking, and speaking was what we were about then in, it, in its essence. And um, if that included a competition, then so be it. Uh, you know, you had to compete at the club level, at the area level, at the division level, 
the district level, the region level, and then at the international level. So once you got your feet wet, of course, everybody wants to win. Everybody likes the taste of success. So I would have competed with younger Toastmasters um, and with older Toastmasters, but you know, may the best man win, even if it's a woman. And so um, I just ended up having to win at the various levels and earned my way to international, which was held in Reno, Nevada in 1986. It was not very easy because you have to almost psych yourself up. I remember the last region level contest. I, I wrote that speech like 13 times, 13 different ways. Um, I remember the title of Behold the Farmer. I remember the, in the um, district competition in Florida. I actually chose number one of nine speakers. And um, But the good thing about it is there were about 40 Bahamians back at the tables supporting me encouraging me and I kind of saw their faces fell when they realized I had chosen number one but the topic at that time was sink or swim motivational speech and I was minded to not begin with my actions the way I, I, I practice at the various levels but to say um, what a pleasure it is to grace this lectern to be the first to grace this lectern because I have a message for you that is of the utmost importance. And once I had said that, it kind of like turned everything around for me. And I felt the behaviors. I saw them, you know, say, oh, go closey, go closey. And so that, that, they were fans that that made a big difference to me. Meanwhile, Club 1600 continued to solidify its own culture. By this point, the club had produced several political leaders a magistrate, and numerous successful businessmen. The club continued to attract up-and-coming young men into the fold via word of mouth and also through the use of daily periodicals to promote weekly meetings and other events. I remember once there, a job became available, a job that before that date was only held by Canadians. job became available and I was on the short list of about three for the job, simply because the man who was running the bank at that time, I'm going to stay away from names, said to me, I have been watching and following a lot of what you've been doing in Toastmasters because a lot of stuff was published in the newspapers back then. He said, and I, I like what I see. I believe you are the right fit for that job. So there you go. You know, just doing what I have been doing for Toastmasters without looking for any benefit because I've never really looked for any benefit. But people recognize what you've been doing and there you go, you get credit for it in one way or the other. I've done everything that I have through the club. Um, all my careers, all my jobs, all my recommendations, um, my children, everything, all was done um, through the clubs. I moved into uh, president of the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants. I moved into Saya Akon, or president of Delta Lambda Boule. Uh, I moved into treasurership of Omega Sci Fi. I was a partner at Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Uh, and in terms of uh, Lodge and Masonic, I was in charge of the District Grand Lodge of the Bahamas. So, yes, 1600 and Toastmasters in general has taken me to all these different places. I guess the key is, what I always say is, uh, look at the persons in Toastmasters who have been around a long time and look at their station in life. And you will see a mirror of what things could be if you stay with the program, you enjoy the program, and you have some long longevity. The members of Club 1600 were moving up into leadership positions and camaraderie within the club was at an all-time high bolstered by an enthusiasm for sports. During this time, Club 1600 would host many sporting events both within the club and in the wider community. These events would feed into the club's popularity. The members of Toastmasters every week would assemble on in Stapleton Gardens 
there's a basketball court there, and we would have basketball for about four or five hours. And after each game, we would go to individual houses who would prepare refreshments and whatnot, and we'd have fellowship during that, for the rest of that Sunday. And, there, and, that, and that's how, that's, that's the reason why we became so well knitted. Because in those days, Toastmasters was really a seven day thing. We had to have committee meetings, we had to have uh, the club meetings, and all of this happened during the weekend, and sports on the weekend. I believe a, a group of us played basketball every Sunday morning, uh, back in the day. Uh, some could have played basketball, some couldn't play basketball. Uh, we also had a, a, a tennis crew that played on a regular basis. Uh, we also had a table tennis crew who played on a regular basis. Uh, but it seems that nobody played golf. Uh, I don't know why golf I, I took up a little later on in life. But those were the main, the main ones uh, back then. Uh, and of course, the staple of the club, the uh, President's Boiled Fish run, uh, that carried on for many, many years. We also had a few uh, walkathons uh, and it kind of depended on, on who the president was. But yeah, we, we were very athletic uh, in the earlier days. When I think about the same old place, I think about Toastmaster Edward Noble Brutus, as we call him, who of course is Ed Carey, highly respected in the club and also in the community among government people as well as people who own their own private businesses. And so after the meeting on a Thursday night, we'll all head down by the same old place on um, Thompson Boulevard and we'll have, you know, there's a time to, to have some drinks, get some snacks and to have fun and also to recount a little bit about the meeting before. It was a place where you form the relationship you born because you build a relationship not only in the club but outside the club at the same old place and we also went there from different times throughout the week and to sit with Ed you get the, uh, the inside story about the club. And that's very important when you join an organization like 1600 to learn the history. One of the most powerful things I've been able to garner from 1600 is the relationships. So I could pretty much, while I work at home, I'm able to touch any industry because in our club, it's so powerful, the members there, I can always call on somebody and say, who do you know is in accounting? Who do you know is in finance? And that's, these are some of the things about 1600 that you really wouldn't get in day one. So when you're born at the places like the same old place and wherever the members go after the meeting, that's where you form lifelong relationships. For every epic rise, there's a period of decline that seems a natural progression. Advancement would continue for individual members such as Club 1600 Samuel Bain who became the first district governor for the Bahamas in 1995. Advancement still continued for Club 1600 in 1998. Installations were moved to Government House and 16 outstanding men of Club 1600 were honored under the patronage of Governor General Sir Orville Turncrest. The country itself also seemed to be moving into a new era of prosperity, but despite the progress on several fronts, the Toastmasters International in the Bahamas was on a decline. You had dis the District 47 and you had the Bahamas Division. In order to keep a division, you had to have at least six clubs. We were going so bad, we were dropping behind, we fell below six clubs. And so what did, what Toastmasters International, or the division did was, they reduced our status, reduced us to a status called Q, which is unacceptable. What that meant was, we could no longer issue any more ABLE Toastmaster designations, any DTMs, or any CTMs. We would have to get it and align with another club. And so, we were, we were, we had some dormant club, we had five clubs, and we had six or seven clubs out there that, that could, maybe could be resident. And so we were, in essence, kicked out, so to speak. 
Several clubs became inactive, prompting the Bahamas to lose its division status and be demoted to an area. The organization found itself at a crossroad. An intervention was needed or the organization would continue to falter. Once again, Club 1600 would step into its leadership role. A select committee of Toastmasters headed by distinguished Toastmaster Jamal Hepburn set out on the task of reinvigorating the program nationally. These gentlemen would work diligently through the adversity of the day to reset and refocus the operating procedures of Toastmasters Club in the Bahamas in a bid to regain the division status. When the question was asked by Toastmaster Tim Percent as to who is going to take over as, as area governor because the current division governor had to be removed and, and so the gentleman turned around and, looked and said, me. Now, they had invited me to the meeting and I told them I, I only wanted to be a support. I, because I was tired, I didn't really want to put myself forward. But after that, I, I took it over. But it was really a, a group effort. We had all clubs on board. And then the opportunity for, for 1,600 members and other members to, to now lead, rather than just leading a club, you lead an area. An area is for clubs. We, we're building back the division. A division is 12 clubs, three areas. So now there is opportunities to grow beyond just being president of a club. The person who should get the real credit for this is Toastmaster Jamal Hepburn. He was in charge of Toastmasters at that time. He worked with them and he got them and he said, Keith, I need a man to take over. So he said, okay, we're gonna try and restore this. He said, I need you to go to a meeting in Florida. I went to the meeting in Florida, walked around, didn't see anybody I liked, picked up, left, and never, and didn't go back. When I got back to Nassau, Jamal said, Major, what is wrong with you? Say, what happened? Say, they saw you coming and you left. He said, and the guy said, no, he's gone, he's gone. I said, I said, nobody said anything to me. He said, the guy's ready to get rid of you. I said, no, give me one more chance. And anyway, the guy name was Paul, who was the district governor. He gave me another chance. He came out here to the Bahamas. We talked, we hooked up, and um, we began resurrecting the other clubs. It was, it was challenging at first. One of the things that one of the, the club that we actually use as a catalyst to to help break that mindset because the 1600 had its, its its own personality and identity, but other clubs had other had, had things that cost them to be in their own little boxes also. So to break that and bring everyone together, Club 7178 was actually the club that was used. To, to change the mindset and to, and, to, and to grow, make the clubs about the personalities of the individuals in the club rather than just certain people controlling the whole mindset and, and the whole character of the club. And so 7178 was, was the club that we used and then 1600 very quickly came on board. One of the things that, that I did, was able to successfully do, was get Toastmasters to be president, VPE, and membership. So we did that at 7178 with Toastmaster Dwayne Davis, Toastmaster Charles Sanders, and Toastmaster Godfrey Springer. Uh, we did it at 9477, and, and I have to give Dwayne Davis credit for the work that he did in making sure that Club 7178 got chartered and got set up, got properly set up uh, as, a, as, as, as a club that we were able to, to build back the entire division of those masters from. The dawn of the new millennium would see the reinstatement of the Bahamas as a division. The momentum started by the Select Committee of Toastmasters would continue leading to the growth and expansion of the organization in the 2000s and beyond. In this era, Godfrey Springer would serve as a second district governor from the Bahamas 
whilst Antoinette Fox would later become the first Bahamian woman to serve as district governor. She is also the only Bahamian to have served as region aid advisor. I look at the district and I realize, you know what? Because there was only one district governor from the Bahamas and it did not end on a positive note for that particular individual based on the district perspective. But I spoke to Sammy Bain, who was the first, and he gave me some insights. And people said, why are you talking to him? I said, because he was the first. And then my view is that there should always be more Bahamians as district governor. And I charted a course to involve myself in the district. I chat with everybody, talk. So I became a submarine. And on the ground, I began to plant my philosophy, my belief, and my love. And I saw a man, when I went to conference, pushing a, not a trolley, but pushing a, a wheel thing with an oxygen tank to his nose. And he was the Lieutenant Governor of Marketing in the district. And I, say, and I see people that had tubes in their nose, you know. And I said, wow, if these could become leaders, why I can not become one of those? And so I kept on doing it. And because the district was mostly elderly Toastmasters, retired, moved to Florida, because Toastmasters District 47 made up of Florida and the Bahamas. And I'm saying to myself, why is it always, it must be a Floridian guiding the district? I didn't look at color, I looked at opportunities. And then as I worked my way up, I began to feel a spirit of leadership. And even though I got discouraged initially, but people tell me, why you want to become leader? It's so much traveling, it's so much up and down. But I decided the journey is worth it. And so I moved up and um, the next year, there were more persons who was vying for the next position. And I won. And then the final year, you know, it's like this guy, looks so we can't beat him. But yet the final year of becoming district governor in 2006, I emerged. I, my theme as district governor was Toastmasters, leave a legacy, dot, 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 make yours unforgettable. And the song by Nat King Cole, Unforgettable, was a song I used in my, in my thing. So, and from there on, I led the road to many more Bahamians becoming district governor. We probably had about four more after that that became district governor. So I was proud to know that despite the challenges, I decided to move the process forward to make a difference, you know. I would have served as division director and also as district governor, division governor, district director, and also region advisor. In the position of division governor, I would have been the first female that would have served in that position in the Bahamas. And I felt that it have an, had an impact on the Toastmasters in the Bahamas because after that, we've had m a number of women who would have jumped on and would have been interested in future leadership in the Toastmasters in the Bahamas. And district governor, when I served 2008, 2009, I would have been the first female district governor from the Bahamas. And that gave an even greater, I would say a greater honor for females because at that time, we know that there was not a female from the Bahamas who would have excelled to that position. And being a district governor, you were a district governor of the Bahamas and South Florida. At that time, the District 47 was almost 300 clubs which meant it was over 6,000 or so members. So that also paved the way for more Bahamians to become involved in becoming in district leadership because before that, we've only had distinguished Toastmaster Springer, Godfrey Springer, who would have been a district director, governor, sorry. Also, I would have served, I would have been called back to serve as a district director. So in the Bahamas, I'm the only individual that carries the title district governor and district director. The lessons of the previous decade were hard learned, but nonetheless necessary for building the foundation upon which the organization would thrive over the next 20 years. The main takeaway was that the policies and educational program of Toastmasters International could under no circumstances be neglected. I used to love coming into the club because they were uh, a sparring team. Uh, you know what, they would have the biggest arguments and this was the time when I learned that if you have a debate and you are against one another, it doesn't mean that you hate or dislike the other person. It means that you are going to intellectually challenge them. 
And that's what I got from Clem Foster and Keep Major. Um, Keep Major would throw a blow. Clem Foster would just calmly speak back to the issue and hit him. So it's a hit one, boom. The next one hit him back, boom. You know, it was just such an intellectual conversation that was amazing. Teaching young men, young women, the ability to verbalize their innermost thoughts so that they're clearly understood is the greatest gift you could offer any mankind, offer to mankind. I believe that back then, and this many years later, I still believe it, and it's still applicable. It's still applicable today, and that's a quote, and that's a tenet that will never die for as long as mankind exists on this earth. Having the ability to verbalize your innermost thoughts so that you're clearly understood is priceless. Priceless yesterday, priceless today, and it'll be priceless tomorrow. So Toastmasters is offering a priceless commodity to young men and young women, and to not so young men and not so young women. Toastmasters 1600 is much more than the membership. For the $200 or so that we charge annually, it's like equivalent to a university degree. When you think about the interaction that you're able to make with all of the other members and you learn from their skills and their training, it's like one of the cheapest tuition you would pay for a university degree when you join Toastmasters Club 1600. In this era, many clubs would make strides to ensure a thorough adaptation of the Toastmasters manuals. Leading the way once again was Club 1600 which would introduce a new method of streamlining speeches in the club. This method would come to be known in Club 1600 as the Lab. Keith Major had a statement in Club, the Learning Laboratory. And the Learning Laboratory was an environment where you learnt. And back then, Keith was a promulgator of inspirational tapes, um, CDs went around then. So Keith would tell you, get in your car and turn it into a learning laboratory. And that resonated with me. And when I became the EVP for Toastmaster Shadow Outen in his year, um, we had a need to create an environment that gave Toastmasters the best chance of success with regards to preparation before coming to the big stage, which was Thursday night. So we came up with an idea, when I say we, me and my executive, I'm going to give some credit to my executives, of course, but, and, and, and Toastmaster Rod, um, Roderick Colbrook, he was very beneficial in the process we started at his house. So we came up with an idea and I say, look, since we're not getting the mentors to be there for the executive, for the members, let's create a scenario where we all are evaluating it before the meeting so that they can have a uh, a myriad of persons saying, you know, how you're doing and to help critique. The Learning Lab, in short order, encouraged, in fact, it became the culture that you came to the lab to practice your speech, to have some of the best Toastmasters available evaluate and give you tips, and you then practice until you draw blood. And then you came Thursday night and you performed like a 1600 man. By 2010, the Bahamas was a renowned and respected division in Toastmasters International. For over 50 years, the country was known for developing stellar leadership and communication programs, as was evident by its members. We have had, as they build on, 50 years of leadership and communications excellence. We have done that in many spheres, even more so nationally, internationally, in political environment, in the leadership environment. We see where we are on a move now, where members are sharing financial experience. They're coaching each other in financial environments, and we are developing that. And to me, I believe that's one of the next levels of leadership. Because we teach leadership and communication, but this thing is so vast. 
in every area, whether it's the family, whether it's the community, whether it's financially, whether it's locally, whether it's internationally. So many different forms of leadership. And we have 50 plus years of leadership and communication excellence in our legacy. And I got into the program in my 20s, just fresh from university abroad, uh, about to build a career and family. So it was ideal for me in assisting me to grow and develop my communication skills. All of these things would then assist me throughout my career uh, from, from junior achievement to Texaco, uh, later to become an attorney at law, and to also enter the field of politics. And so there, there's so many opportunities that that you can benefit having been a part of those masters. And, and so the experiences are uh, uh, second to none. And if you are passionate about improving yourself and you take advantage of it, the sky is the limit to you. Pamela Rowe was elected Bahamian District Governor in 2011, and Anthony Longley of Club 1600 became the fifth Bahamian to serve in the post in 2014. Distinguished Toastmaster Anthony Longley went on to become the first Bahamian elected to the Board of Directors of Toastmasters International, a crowning achievement for Distinguished Toastmaster Longley and the Bahamas as a whole. I like to encourage individuals in, in, any, in any endeavor to be careful about measuring yourself against anyone else. Okay? First of all, you must know where you, where, you, where you stand. You must be able to know your own measurements, your own statistics, and you measure yourself against your best self. And I, that's a lesson I had to learn. You know, when I joined those masters initially, I wanted to drop out many times. I see youngsters join now, and they come in as a dynamo, and they, they run through the first year or two in a sprint. But for me, my initial journey was more of a, a marathon than a sprint. It took me three years to complete the first manual in Toastmasters that we call the Beginner's Manual, a 10 speech project that takes most new members less than 10 months. It took me three years to the month. The reason is, I was so afraid. I had this unbreakable phobia of getting up before the, the group. And so every time I was assigned by the VPE, miraculously, I got the flu. And I didn't show up for the meeting. And I did that many times. So I moved through the program at a snail's pace, taking three years to earn my first certificate in Toastmasters. So it wasn't always the way it is now. Mine was a rough journey. Beyond 2010, Club 1600 would see new and innovative leaders rise to the position of president. These Toastmasters would be tasked with bringing in new energy, a sense of modernization and innovation to the club while maintaining the values present from the club's inception. The leadership tour was new. Under Maya, we toured the islands of Elutra as well as Grand Bahama. My year, we had the 45 years of Toastmastering in the Bahamas. So we went to our first, the first club, that the second club actually, that was in the Bahamas, which was Freeport Eagles, 1645. So we had our first club meeting with them. It was a joint club meeting whereby 1,600 men, we actually conducted the whole meeting along with members of 1495. So it was a great meeting for our 40, 45th years of Toastmastering in the Bahamas. We also did the same in Elutra, whereby we met with the team from Elutra, the Elutra executives, the area governor, and we had a wonderful meeting there as well. So the leadership tours are certainly the hallmark of, of, of my year. So during our time in our era, we would have started several youth initiatives. We did work at and with the Ranfilly Home for Kids. We did work at the Simpson Penn School for Boys. We did extensive work with the Gentlemen's Club 
as well as several other Gyalvo clubs that other Toastmasters clubs had initiated. So we decided that rather than being insular, we would lead by example and be a part of the youth leadership programs that other clubs were doing. We started and supported several new clubs who had just begun, and we made sure that there was that youth and that transition to the next generation as a key part of our year. I will never forget Ladies' Night. I, I me and, and my whole my whole team worked really hard to make it really the best ladies' night that could be. And I remember it as the best ladies' night. I may be biased, but it was very well organized. We have excellent speakers. We we took time to prepare our speakers. We had a full room, the, the ballroom at the breezes, all the way to the back, people standing up to the back. Uh, and I also had a um, cinematographer taking video. I had the on the butchers, the DJ, uh, we had the um, ice cream man, we had Carlos Palacios as the the son of a preacher man. We had tripartite of a woman by Valentina Monroe. They were all excellent speakers. And I, it's a night that I never forget. Not to be outdone by the previous generation's leadership, the new era has been determined to leave their own mark on the club as well as the community in general. The young men that Club 1600 continues to attract are resourceful and will often choose an out-of-the-box method of addressing a common task or challenge. The beauty of this organization is its membership. In this COVID environment, we were able to attract some awesome new members. We were able to conduct the membership drive, not the regular membership drive where you will go and set up somewhere and invite people out, complex and all these other stuff. No, we realized that in this COVID environment, it was imperative that persons are equipped with the skills that they need to advance themselves from a leadership standpoint and also from a communication standpoint. So we started a membership series. This membership series were able to deal with core competencies of resume building, how to effectively use your time. And as a result of that, we were able to attract the right individuals. And once these individuals came into the club, they, bring, they bought their expertise. They bought their expertise in the sense of presentation, digital presentation, that was able to help to transform the meeting on the virtual platform. The 2010s would also see a proliferation of new events honoring mentors of the club, as well as others who would have made significant contributions, thus immortalizing these members in the halls of Club 1600. The Neil Presenti Back to School event came under the year that I was president. And in terms of Toastmasters, this would have been the year 2011, 2012. It was September 2012 that uh, he met his untimely demise. And the then EVP, um, distinguished Toastmaster Pedro Young, um, he saw it fit to, I guess, find a way to, or he found a way to honor one of our um, members, and hence the idea of the Neil Presenti Back to School Day was was born. Persons in this community, the young kids would be able to get the haircut, um, as uh, just on the curb of getting back to school, the back to school, back to school um, jamboree. So they get the haircut. Um, we would have hot dogs, we'd have hamburgers, and I reach out to other Toastmasters. Uh, I, I think that year we had about maybe 15 of the kids in Union Village participated. Um, we had the mobile barbershop. He was, he had just gotten his bar mobile barbershop. And so he lent a hand, and his name is Artnell Smith. So he lent a hand, and, and today, as I look back at it, 
what we start off with having 15 kids at this event went to three to four hundred kids. Person from around the community came. Other Toastmaster Club joined in. Other civic organization um, made donations. And this was something that we did on our own. And it's still going on today. I was the last president to have a leadership and communication banquet. Uh, I think you may have heard about that from some of the other past presidents, Toastmasters, the White Boroughs, Distinguished Toastmaster Boroughs, was the first president um, to, to start the leadership communication banquet. I was the last person to have an actual banquet. And uh, we honored um, Commissioner Paul Farkerson at the time uh, with leadership, leadership and Communication Award. And uh, that was definitely my most memorable experience uh, as a Toastmaster, um, especially as president. Um, because that was uh, an opportunity for us to really recognize uh, so many people in the community, men in particular, for the work that they were doing in their various um, areas of focus, uh, whether it's in the community, whether it's banking and finance, insurance, whatever it was. Uh, so that was a real joy for me to see all of those people in one room um, with so much leadership and, and, and influence. Uh, that was really a drive for me, to, uh, for me to experience. Even as they continue to break ground with new ideas in this new era, the connection to the past has been well maintained through the mentorship of senior members who have stayed committed to the program over the years. These mentors have guided countless members of the club along the path to success. Yes, I always had my three main mentors. Clem Foster, Keith Major, and Tony Longley. They, they were the go-to people when I needed advice. Clem Foster was the inspiration for me to join the executive initially. Uh, the words of Keith Major, he always gave you the tricks, how to do things parliamentary, how to pass uh, certain bills. The club was always some sort of uh, a training room for politics and of course to keep within Toastmasters International Tony Longley always said okay no no you can't go there you can't do this but do it this way or don't forget to do this this is part of Toastmasters International and to keep it going and I definitely following those three and of course having an, an, an excellent team with me help us achieve exponentially. We, we did more goals than anybody in the district and we're named the number one club in the district because of all the achievements in education that we had. I try my best to be that big brother because I was just like them growing up. Man, when they come in the club, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to connect with. So I like to put myself in that big brother mold, mold for all the new members in Club 1600. To meet men where they are and to see young men develop and thrive and, and become themselves, I think it's like uh, watching a flower come from the bud to full bloom. And you get to witness that in the life of young men. And uh, I mean, how could that not be a great thing to see, you know? And coming to 1600 gives me an opportunity to see that. And uh, it's incredible. When one considers the components that make the education program of Toastmasters International so effective, the evaluation process will be featured prominently. Evaluation helps members learn how to accept positive criticism, an act that helps them to refine their skills. In the laboratory of leadership that is Club 1600, evaluation extends beyond the craft of speech writing. It can be personal and sometimes uncomfortable, but there are great rewards to be reaped by members that shows resilience in the face of fear or failure. I I'm the last international champion in terms of the district level, having won the evaluation contest. That was, I guess, a decade ago now. And so that would have been one of the crowning moments of my Toastmasters journey. 
And it wasn't because of the trophy or the victory, but it counted the failures that I would have made and the feelings that would have come from that and the growth and the lessons. So after having participated in speech contests for years and quarters after each other, the opportunity to see and culminate the lessons and the wisdom that would have been instilled on me from the previous failures to come back and win was a crowning moment. And I think it speaks to the value of the legacy and the discipline that the club instills in you when you stick with it. I would have to say that the person who influenced me the most through I, I would call it reverse psychology, if I can say that, was Toastmaster, distinguished Toastmaster Anthony Longley. Well, I was criticized heavily by this particular Toastmaster, so much so that I wanted to quit Toastmasters altogether because I already came into the club thinking that I was, I, I didn't need any Toastmaster. I was doing good in my career. I was financially stable and so much things was going good for me. And to come into an organization where I'm being ridiculed, I'm being, I think they call it evaluated, but when he did my evaluations, he did it more on the, the negative side. And, and this continued when I became, uh, when I went on to the executive. Those, evalu those negative evaluations continued with me um, by him. And it wasn't until I, I spoke to another Toastmaster that I understood now what he was trying to do and that was he was actually building me he was making me a stronger me and he was broadening my shoulders that these evaluations was not to embarrass me but it was to encourage me it was to uplift me and and because i did not quit and because i decided that i'm gonna press on no matter what the evaluation was no matter what the situation um, was before me, I decided I'm gonna stick with it. And as a result of sticking with it, I was able to go through the other executive ranks and eventually emerge as president of Toastmasters Club 1600. Regardless of what era they would have joined, members of Club 1600 can all attest to the transformational power of the Toastmasters program and the positive impact that membership in the club has had on their lives. Each class president of Club 1600 has hoped that their impact would be felt by future members of Club 1600. Division I, you know, we are part of District 47, and at this time we have 21 clubs. We began the year July 1, 2020 with 19 clubs. And even though we're in a pandemic, we were fortunate that we chartered a club in San Salvador, the San Salvador Explorers. We chartered that October 2020. And in December 2020, we chartered a second club, the ABC Ambassadors, which is a church club, Annex Baptist Church. Young, vibrant, exciting, and they're going to go places. And we have another club, Bahamas Integrated Toastmasters Club. We're a few weeks away from chartering. I don't want to say weeks because it's less than that, but we're almost at chartering point, and that is going to be an interesting club. The president-to-be, he's hearing impaired. We have members who are visually challenged. We have members who are in wheelchair, but as we like to say in the club, disability does not mean inability. And you know, Toastmaster Spurgeon Neely, if you hear him before you see him and you don't know that he's visually challenged, you say blind where? One of our other board members, she placed second in the Division Speed International Speech Contest. Powerful story. And we have another prospective club in Grand Bahama, Eat Mile Rock, another community club. They are doing demo meetings. And another club that we are looking to charter. For me, growing the clubs is an opportunity to perhaps ask for another area. That means another opportunity for somebody else to serve at the district level. And you know, that is a requirement to get the DTM. So that is one of the things that we are looking this year to Division I. One more month ago, but we're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. When I first joined our organization, 
you know, my my thing was, you know, how am I going to make this role that I'm serving in better? What legacy am I going to leave behind as relates to this role that I'm presently serving in? As good as my year appeared to be going right now, I don't feel any success from it until I've completed the Postmasters Club 1600 documentary and a few other projects that I had on the table. Because for me, the vision was to complete those stuff. And for another year to go by and those items are not being completed, then it feels like I fail as a president. And so it's just believing in the vision and, and getting it done. Leaving the job done and not undone. And so that was a part of what it was for me as membership, as VPE, as president. But it was definitely the mentorship along the way that assisted me in fulfilling this vision. And yeah, so at the end of the day, that's what it was about. It was about not just serving, but making a difference. And that, that's, that's what it was all about for me. Thanks to many, there exists great optimism for the future of the club. As for the future of Toastmasters International in the Bahamas, well, that looks bright too, as long as Bahamians continue to use their voices. For the things we say today will become tomorrow's echoes. Stand for justice. Stand for truth. Uh, how did you get the name? If we be our brothers, <laughs> The name AAA got when I ran for the officer sergeant arms, and it was sort of my pitch, you know, don't vote for me to be a sergeant arms, but to be an aunting at arms, and from there AAA just stuck, and from sergeant arms, I used the name AAA to represent my leadership style. You know, my AAA leadership comprises of authenticity, accountability, and adaptability, all the traits that I see, that I believe are good good fit for any leader who wants to become a great leader. Lancelot, <laughs> yeah, so that was a big time in the club and uh, Toastmaster George Taylor was being uh, stripped away of his presidency and there was, and there still is a mantra, a belief that the president is the president, you know, and uh, I thought it unfair that George Taylor would be um, treated in the way that he was being treated. I didn't know the background or any background, but just the look of it seemed to me to be unfair. And uh, Lancelot is the favorite knight of King George. No, um, not King. King Arthur. King Arthur's favorite knight is the Lancelot. And that name was stuck with me because it's the Lancelot. I was protecting the king and I supported the king. And uh, we became Sir Lancelot ever since. My nickname, LDV, is derived from Lord Darth Vader. Lord Darth Vader is a Star Wars, Star Wars character. I got the name because of another character in the club, Omar Archer, is also called Skywalker. He is called Skywalker because of something that happened quite a while ago. So one night, during a competition, one of my first, probably my third phase, um, he spoke, I spoke, and that night I was awarded Speaker of the Night. So technically, I beat Skywalker. So therefore, they give me the name Lord Darth Vader because Lord Darth Vader in the Star Wars beats Skywalker. So I got the name LDV because I beat Skywalker, who's a marcher. In 1979, there was a revolution in Iran. The Shah of Iran was hosted, and the Ayatollah Khomeini went in and he had all the fans and he took over Iran. And so it was a sign of influence and power. It was around that time I entered the club and I said I want to have that kind of influence in a positive way. And so actually I dubbed myself the Ayatollah. And ever since that, people have been calling me the Ayatollah. That's why I, 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 it signified, it signified leadership, 
To me, it's excited. Leadership, power, the ability to influence in a positive way. And that is why I, I, I dub myself that. And it stuck. Sam Mitchell found that I was extremely helpful in his year as president. And at the end of the year, when we did, I did a speech called the executive phase. <laughs> Which I punched little jokes at him, but, but really, you know, talked a lot about the seriousness of what he did during the year. When I was finished, he said to me, after the, not after the meeting, but after the education session, he said, Clem, you're truly a gem from the night I dub you. Clem the gem. <laughs> and the name just stuck. The name just, maybe because it rhymed, eh? Clem the Gem, maybe because it rhymed, but it just, it just stuck and over the years, that, that was it, everywhere you go, it's Clem the Gem, Clem the Gem. The movie Wall Street uh, was a hit, box office hit, and at the time I wore Italian silk suspenders, I wore Italian ties that matched the silk suspenders, and I wore Nino Soretti suits. And Keith came up with the name Gordon Gecko. And the name is stuck to this day, Gecko. And the fact that I wake up at three o'clock in the morning only gave, I guess, life to the name because money doesn't sleep. And if you know the movie, there was this scene where Gordon Gecko's on the beach and he picks up this big block cell phone and he calls. To, to his protege and he goes, what's up? And he goes, hey, I'm sleeping. You sleeping? Money doesn't sleep. Get up. Can you hear the surf? Can you hear the money being made? And that's been my attitude. Money doesn't sleep. Get up. Get going. Get go. They used to call, they used to call me Hitler back then. I believe Chief Major had something to do with that. And um, most of the nicknames around the club, he he can be credited for good or good, bad or ugly, and um, but that was because I tried to run a tight ship. I tried to manage the time of the meetings. I tried to manage how long persons can speak so that we can end the meeting in a reasonable time, so that we can move on to the meeting after the meeting, which was a big part of our culture back then. Now, any given night in Toastmasters, Club 1600 is a rowdy one where you need to manage the crowd and ensure its control. I was a no-nonsense sergeant at arms. And, uh, and so, under Toastmaster, Dwayne Davis' term, for some reason, uh, the nights were just a lot rowdy. Uh, and, and there was always uh, some, some member who was kicking up a fuss. On this particular night, Toastmaster Pedro Ferguson had some issue and he was making noise and he was out of control and being unruly. I'd find them a couple of times and that was the easy part. The challenging part was trying to collect. And so I remember going back and forth with, with Pedro a couple of times, uh, asking him to pay his fines. And boy, he must have gotten tired. Uh, and again, he is a very good friend of mine. But I, the last time I went to him to try and collect, Pedro just, just jumps up. And he says, Mr. President, why is this Long Island bomber fly harassing me? And listen, the, the entire room erupt, erupted in laughter. And uh, from that day, I was affectionately known as the Long Island bomber fly or LIBF for short.